I'm really delighted to be uh, here with you tonight. Thanks so much for coming out on a Friday night. I was slightly worried you might have taken the wrong turning and weren't actually coming for an environmental talk on a Friday night. But of course, this is Oxford and you are. So thank you so much <laughs> for being here. And it's a particular pleasure to be at the Environmental Change Institute, home to so much that is pioneering and radical and inspirational in the quest for our very future. So I guess we live in what can only be described as interesting times, and I'd argue that the need for green politics is greater than ever. Times when the words of the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu seem especially resonant, as he counsels us, when storms come, some build walls, some are thrown by the wind, others build windmills. And for green politics, the challenge, I think, is how to build those windmills fast enough both literally and metaphorically. How do we get things moving? How do we build something that is big and powerful as well as beautiful and in motion? How do we make the links between social and environmental justice? How do we foster local action while still being mindful that we are part of a global community? And how do we build a politics that will safely take us through the 21st century and beyond in a sustainable way? Well, according to Theresa May's environment plan launched last week, don't worry, everything's pretty straightforward. You simply urge supermarkets to set up plastic-free aisles. <laughs> you set a vague long-term goal to eliminate unavoidable plastic using, uh, without any definition, of course, about what unavoidable is uh, and without any clear framework about how you're going to make it happen. Um, and if possible, put it to a timetable of 2042, 25 years hence, when you're certainly going to not be in office if you're even still with us here on Earth. So um, that's being a little bit cynical, perhaps a little bit unkind. To be a bit more generous, the fact that the Prime Minister was even making an environment speech was, of course, hugely welcome. As were the positive sounding words from her Secretary of State, Michael Gove, to the food and farming community gathered here in Oxford just a few weeks earlier. And certainly under Gove's leadership, we have seen the environment rise up the government's agenda. Promises to ban neonicotinoids, promises to require farmers to earn their support for delivering environmental benefits rather than simply linking that to output alone. Proposals to install CCTV and in slaughterhouses to spend £5.7 million on planting new trees. All of that does undoubtedly mark progress. The positive headlines being generated are certainly plentiful. And amongst the newly aware Blue Planet generation, there is a growing clamour for action, and even the Daily Mail is on board. So all is good, or is it? Well, while each, each of those initiatives, of course, can be welcomed, I'd argue that they simply don't add up to an approach that could in any way be described as a plan, let alone one that's either commensurate with the scale of the challenge that we face, or rooted in a fundamental understanding of environmental sustainability. Focusing on only the low-hanging fruits of environmental protection is a bit like treating heart disease with a bypass without changing your diet or taking up regular exercise. It is not a sustainable solution for the long term. It's bad enough that we seem to have largely forgotten the 2010 coalition agreement committed to delivering a zero-waste economy and then very shortly afterwards went on to scrap local authority recycling targets. It's worse, if not criminal, that the 25-year environment plan contained no action at all on the climate crisis, and was silent on the huge transformation that's needed to every part of our economy if we are to rise to the greatest threat that we face today. Now, ridding our seas of plastic is, of course, important. But if the climate continues to overheat, then marine mammals face an even greater threat. Because of climate breakdown, sea levels are relentlessly rising. Our coral reefs are devastated. Acidification is killing wildlife and the number of dead zones that simply can't sustain any marine life have quadrupled in the last 50 years alone. So I would argue that the single best way that the government could protect the environment would be to stand up to the fossil fuel firms and commit to keeping oil and gas in the ground. They should commit to a ban on fracking, an end to the fuel duty freeze, no more airport expansion, no more nuclear power. They should make a serious commitment to renewable energy and energy efficiency. Now, plans and promises are easy to make. A way to generate warm headlines and effectively detoxify the Tory brand. 
But let us not forget we have been here before. You know, back in 2006, David Ross Cameron was out there in the Arctic hugging his huskies. But very shortly after getting into power, we went from hugging huskies to culling badgers and dismissing green crap. And that happened in a worryingly short period of time. So green politics demands an approach in which policies are joined up, not one in which the environment is effectively treated as a bolt-on extra, not one in which it's treated as a kind of a silo clumsily bolted onto business as usual, when what we need to do is to change the very way that we do business in the first place. So green politics in the 21st century needs to be joined up and it also needs to be international. It needs to recognise that environmental problems don't queue up politely at borders waiting for their papers to be checked, but are by their very nature cross-border. The air pollution from France pollutes the air of southern England and no doubt vice versa. The chemicals discharged into our water supply can end up in polar bears on the other side of the globe. And the climate emissions of one country impact on all of us. And that of course brings me to Brexit. And it's been a good few minutes before I actually mentioned it, which I think is pretty good going. <coughs> but the cold reality of Brexit poses a major threat to environmental protection, and it does risk undermining ministers' warm words on their newfound environment friendliness. Put simply, there is an enormous environment-shaped hole in the government's Brexit plans. The EU withdrawal bill, which we've been debating again in Parliament this week, may indeed transfer EU law onto the British statute book. That's what it's designed to do. But right now, there is currently no provision in that bill to ensure that those laws are properly monitored and, crucially, enforced by institutions here in the UK. And that is deeply worrying. Let's not forget that the only reason that the government started to take air pollution seriously in London, for example, was because of the threat of fines from the EU. If we no longer have the European Commission monitoring compliance with environmental law, if we no longer have the European Court of Justice there to enforce it, then we need equally strong domestic institutions with real teeth here at home. And I've been working in Parliament to try to plug that governance gap, most recently by seeking to amend that EU bill as it went through Parliament. Because although the government has recently committed to setting up an independent statutory watchdog, which of course is to be welcomed, there is absolutely no guarantee that it will reach the statute book before the end of March next year. Indeed, there is every likelihood that it won't get anywhere near it, given the current paralysis in Whitehall, where anything that isn't directly a Brexit bill is being kicked into the very, very long grass. <coughs> and if that's the case, that would leave us with this very large governance gap, a set of so-called zombie legislation, which is on the statute book here in the UK, but which lacks the measures and the instruments to make sure that it's properly enforced. And I think it's even more urgent that that gap is closed, given the government's enthusiasm to secure new, new trade deals with countries like the US as soon as possible, and potentially wanting to secure those trade deals on pretty much any terms. I worry that the government is under such pressure, really, to demonstrate the success of Brexit, that basically any kind of trade deal, for example, with the US will be accepted. The temptation, I think, to water down environmental standards is going to be extraordinary. And let's not forget that greater deregulation is indeed one of the reasons cited by some of the most ardent Brexiteers for wanting to leave the EU in the first place. So many of us will be familiar with the threat of being forced to import so-called chlorine-washed chicken, but believe me, that is only the start of it. Other so-called regulatory divergences between the EU and the US might mean we'd also be forced to accept the delights of hormone-treated beef, chicken litter being used as animal feed, GM food, brominated vegetable oil, which interestingly is also used as a flame retardant and is a likely hormone disruptor, and plenty more <coughs> besides. So we need those strong mechanisms, enforcement agencies here at home. But I've also argued that that EU withdrawal bill should provide for the incorporation of all the EU environmental principles as well, including the precautionary principle, the polluter pays principle. Absolutely key principles that underpin so much of our current environmental legislation, but which will arguably have no legal force after Brexit unless we make provision to explicitly transfer them into UK law. So the Secretary of State should use the EU withdrawal bill to get on with doing what he's already promised in theory to do, and not to cut corners while doing it. So a number of us have been putting down amendments in this withdrawal bill process over the last few weeks, 
And sadly, the government hasn't supported any of them. But all of that, I think, makes it essential that 21st century green politics adheres to the old but still very relevant adage that you need to think local but act global. And that action must be about collaboration and cooperation to protect our environment, not trampling all over it in the rush to secure new, new trade deals post-Brexit. The post-Brexit landscape also poses a risk to social justice in the form of hard-won protections for workers' rights, for example, which are just as likely to be dumped when trade partners are being wooed. Again, deregulation and non-intervention are the watchwords of those trying to shape this brave new world. And again, I think green politics has to get better explaining at explaining why in an economy in which the gap between rich and poor continues to widen is incompatible with our core values, with our vision of an economy that's about creating opportunities for people to live larger lives. Now, policies like a basic income scheme are about reimagining and renegotiating the relationship between state and individual as part of an economy that serves us, not the other way around. Policies like a four-day working week are designed to help rebalance our lives, sharing work more equally and responding constructively to some of the downsides that automation might well bring with it. So from a genuine living wage to a fairer tax system, from homes fit to live in and everyone with a roof over their heads, to affordable public transport, human rights and decently run and publicly owned public services, I would make the case that social and environmental justice are inseparable. <coughs> And the social justice sphere is also a space where we can start to reject the notion that only time spent working or consuming has economic value. In an economy where the goal is not growth, but rather the well-being of our planet and all its citizens, then I'd argue everything changes. Because once basic material needs are satisfied, modern economies increasingly rely on commercialising so-called positional goods in order to achieve growth. And that means, in the powerful words of Professor Tim Jackson, that the advertising industry essentially kicks in, trying to persuade us to spend money we don't have, to buy things we don't need, to make impressions that don't last on people we don't even care about. And that has massive implications for our planet. Because those so-called status goods, goods that have got nothing to do with actual need, but are all about signalling who we are to other people, they too can have very damaging environmental impacts. But that also has social implications. In a constant competition for status, we end up destroying our beauty spots, we end up turning art into commodities, we end up eroding our education system. By pandering to the most selfish aspects of human nature, we end up hindering satisfaction and undermining social solidarity. Now, back in 1977, economic growth still just about helped poorer people more than it helped the richest in society. Wealth, perhaps at that time, could be argued to have some kind of trickle-down effect, albeit painfully slowly. But today, that certainly is no longer the case. Today, the main beneficiaries of growth are the super-rich. In the US, for example, the top 0.001% of the population have seen their incomes rise by 6% on average each year since 1980, almost five times the average rate of growth. And in the last couple of decades, middle-class incomes have stagnated at best, and the poorest 5% of the population have actually seen their incomes fall in real terms. And things are not so very different here in the UK either. And the political ramifications of that inequality, I think, are all around us. Trump's America, the trauma of Brexit, communities across the UK devastated by the decline of traditional industries and a chronic lack of investment. Those left behind in the positional race are voicing their discontent in whatever way they can. And green politics is the only politics that really does grapple both with that and with the reality that growth has both social and environmental limits. So I've spoken quite a lot so far about, about things that need to happen, but I've not said so much about how they're going to happen, how we're going to generate the political will to make them happen and to make them happen quickly. Because there is a real urgency to this agenda and a very real risk that unless we take urgent action, we humans will go down in history as the species that spent all its time monitoring its own extinction rather than taking active steps to avoid it. And I admit it, green politics has yet, not yet found the, the impetus for the, for the major changes that are, that are needed. And perhaps 
One reason, there are many reasons, the electoral system was one of them, certainly, but still, when it comes to really galvanizing that political will, one of the reasons, perhaps, that we've not succeeded yet in doing that is because to achieve the kind of things I've talked about so far, we need to go beyond the facts, the theories, the abstract figures, the, the policies, if you like. We need to touch people's hearts as well as their heads if we're to make real progress. And so the question I wanted to spend the rest of this evening exploring with you is this. How do we mobilise people to finally take that action that is so desperately needed to protect our planet, our precious and our only home? Because that's how we transform Britain. That is at the very heart and soul of green politics. And it's a question that we must ask with ever-increasing urgency because time is running out. There is such a thing as being too late. The evidence of the accelerating climate crisis is all around us, and yet we just simply still fail to act. Some of you may remember a film that was made almost 10 years ago now, and it was called The Age of Stupid. And it was based on the premise that following some kind of climate catastrophe in around 2050, there was one sole survivor played by the inimitable and much missed Pete Pothelswaite, and in that film, he looks back to now at reels of television footage, real footage of weather events now and from the early 2000s, things like the typhoons in the Philippines, the heat waves in Australia, the freezing temperatures in the US. And he says in words that still make the hairs go up on the back of my neck every time I say them, he says, why is it, knowing what we knew then, we didn't act when there was still time? And that to me just is the most overwhelming question. It quite literally haunts me. And it cannot be that we lack the evidence of what's going on around us. We know that last year was the hottest year on record, that the previous record was set in 2016, the one before that in 2015, the one before that in 2014, that 16 of the 17 warmest years on record happened this century. Arctic sea ice covered a smaller area last winter than in any winter since records began. India has been hammered by cycles of drought and floods. Southern and Eastern Africa have been pitched into humanitarian emergencies by drought. Wildfire storms across America, coral reefs around the world are bleaching and dying. And about a year ago in Canada, due to intense glacial melting, the course of an entire river shifted. The Slims River, once full of life and energy, quite simply vanished. So it isn't that the evidence isn't there. Now, this talk is called Transforming Britain, but Britain and the rest of the world are already being transformed because of climate breakdown. And that is not the kind of transformation we need, but unless we wake up, far worse could be to come. So green politics in the 21st century needs to grapple with why it is that we are essentially still sleepwalking into the future of climate instability. It needs to understand better why we don't act with sufficient speed. And there are lots of reasons for sure. One of them may well also be the power and vested interests of the fossil fuel companies, who increasingly are not simply lobbying government, but being given senior roles within it. Or that people are just too busy trying to get by, trying to keep a roof over their heads while housing benefit is cut, trying to live a life in a dignified way while disability payments are being slashed. But I'm going to suggest that another crucial part of the reason could be that we don't dare feel what climate change is about. So academically, in our heads, abstractly, we know the facts, we know the dangers of exceeding two degrees warming. But in all of the discussions about parts per million of carbon dioxide, we rarely have the time and perhaps the courage to overcome fear and emotionally connect with that reality. I'm struck by the phrase that we won't protect what we do not love. The American author, Richard Louvre, puts it like this. We cannot protect something we do not love. We cannot love what we do not know. And we cannot know what we do not see and touch and hear. The wonderful writer Zadie Smith has written about how it is this love which might just be the thing that can spur us to action. And she writes about it so beautifully in an article in the New York Review of Books that I hope you don't mind if I quote quite a long passage of what she says. And she says this, There is the scientific and ideological language for what is happening to the weather, but there are hardly any intimate words. Is that surprising? People in mourning tend to use euphemism. 
likewise the guilty and ashamed, the most melancholy of all the euphemisms, the new normal. It's the new normal, I think, as a beloved pear tree, half drowned, loses its grip on the earth and falls over. The train line to Cornwall washes away, the new normal. We can't even say the word abnormal to each other out loud. It reminds us of what came before. Better to forget what was once normal, the way season followed season with temperate charm only the poets appreciated. We always knew we could do a great deal of damage to this planet, but even the most hubristic amongst us had not imagined we would ever be able to fundamentally change its rhythms and characters. Just as a child who has screamed all day at her father still does not expect to see him lie down on the kitchen floor and weep. Oh, what have we done? It's a biblical question and we do not seem able to pull ourselves out of its familiarity, essentially religious, this familiar cycle of shame and denial and self-fragilation. This is why the apocalyptic scenarios did not help. The terrible truth is that we had a profound historical attraction to apocalypse. In the end, the only thing that could create the necessary traction in our minds was the intimate loss of the things we loved, like when the seasons changed in our beloved island. So my conclusion for tonight is this, that yes, we need more ambitious policies to avoid the worst of the climate crisis. And yes, government and councils have a key role to play. But in terms of the people who are going to put the pressure on those institutions to act, then it is down to us and the people around us. And maybe it is time that we take the time to stop and to really feel what climate breakdown means and to recognise what we risk losing as a result, that intimate loss of the things we love. Maybe it's only when we do that, we make that connection, that we can draw even more strongly on our own energy and resources to mobilise action to prevent it. I appreciate that that is a conclusion based on hope rather than fact. But it's hope not as in wishful thinking, not hope as in having your fingers crossed behind your back, not hope like clutching a lottery ticket, but radical hope, the kind of hope that can change things. Change things because you love them enough to connect with them and to imagine a different and better future. And having imagined it, having that compelling vision of how things could be, you then have more energy to work to achieve it. I hope you'll forgive one last quotation from another favourite author, Rebecca Solnit. And writing about hope, she says this. Hope is an axe you break down doors with in an emergency. Because hope should shove you out the door. Because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of the Earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor and marginal. Hope just means another world might be possible. Not promised, not guaranteed. Hope calls for action. And action is impossible without hope. So tonight I want to call people to action. Remember what you love and do all you can to fight for it. And of course there are reasons to be hopeful. 2016 may well have been one of the hottest years on record, but it was also the year that Portugal, for example, ran entirely off renewable energy for four consecutive days. The number of solar powered homes in California topped six million. Volunteers in India planted 50 million trees in 24 hours. That's a lot of volunteers. At Standing Rock, Native American climate change heroes halted the construction of the Dakota Access oil pipeline, at least for a while. <coughs> and for the first time in 100 years, the number of tigers in the wild increased. And another reason for hope is the growing realisation that the changes that we need to make in order to tackle the climate crisis, to learn to live more sustainably, are positive changes in their own right. They would be good things to do even if we didn't face a climate crisis. One of my favourite cartoons is of a professor in a lecture theatre, much like this one, standing in front of the whiteboard. And on the whiteboard she's written all the advantages of shifting to a zero carbon economy, properly insulated homes, people living no longer in fuel poverty, having more healthy local food systems, more people having time out of the office, more public transport being far more affordable, having kids playing in the streets again. And one of her students has their hand up and the speech bubble says, but what if climate change is a hoax and we've created a better world for no reason? <laughs> Making a better world is what green politics seeks to do. Yes, elections matter, as does educating people, demonstrating alternatives, setting out a vision, bringing people together, and yes, voting. But the starting point of all of that 
is planting love and planting hope. Building windmills, not putting up walls or being thrown by the wind. And that's how we transform Britain and how we transform the future. And we do it by recognising that all of us are the people that we're waiting for. Thank you. I completely agree with the thesis that you've set out. And I think George Monbiot in his new book absolutely takes that as the starting point. The idea that we've been fed a narrative both about, about what's happening, but also about who we are as human beings, i.e. a narrative that human beings tend to be competitive and don't help one another and so on. And he really challenges that strongly and, and, and begins to set out what an alternative narrative might be like which shows all of the examples of, of, of how animals and indeed the humans do help one another and work with each other altruistically, not simply because it suits our, our selfish genes, if you like. So I think there's a, I, I agree with you. I think there is this growing sense that a different story, a more positive story is far more motivating than, than the apocalyptic v vision of just saying everything's going to hell in a handcart. And your only you know, normal response will be just to go down the pub and forget all about it because you do feel utterly disempowered in that scenario. So to your question, can green politics be part of painting that alternative picture? I, I absolutely passionately believe that it, that it can um, and that it will be far more motivational to do that um, than, than the alternative, than constantly telling the, the, the bad stories. You need, you, need, you need both to some extent. We need to know what we're risking otherwise. But I think the more that we can demonstrate, as I was just trying to do at the end there, that the, the kind of world which is going to be sustainable is also likely to be a world in which is much more positive in so many other ways that you would want, even if it were not the case, that it's going to be a better world sustainably, for, for sustainability reasons. Th th then that, I think, is a much more attractive way of of, of bringing people with you. And, and, and George Marshall's done some fantastic work as well, obviously, in, at, at COIN here, in terms of, of painting those pictures, vivid, compelling pictures of what a zero carbon world can look like, and, and to do it in a way that, that is attractive and makes people want to move towards it, which is probably a lot more, um, a, a lot more attractive than, than, than the painting of the, of, of the miserable picture of what we're trying to avoid. Individual empowerment, I think, is, 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 is one of the most important things to get across because I think politics for, for a great many years has basically essentially told people that they don't have power and that all they need to do is tick a, a box, um, you know, once every four or five years and, and, and other people will sort it out. Um, I, I think that that sense that, that people can make a difference, that even a handful of people can make a difference, is, is one of the most exciting and important things that we can try to to get across in our education system and so on to, to really make people aware and be much more um, engaged with the idea that, that they can make a difference, that, 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 that it's not a question of just simply sitting back. And, and so that kind of sense of, of an empowered community, I think has got to be absolutely part of the, of the solution. Well, thank you for the question. And, and yes, I do think that there is a, a very large latent number of people who, who could vote green and hopefully will vote green. I mean, I'm still struck by the fact that in 2015, a million people voted green. And the difficulty is, of course, that a million people voted green and we still only got one MP. And so the other side of what you're saying, and I, 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 I'm not using this as a way of deflecting from the fact that we have work to do too in terms of honing our message and our vision and so forth, but it does come down to this horrible, archaic, undemocratic electoral system that means that so many people actually don't vote in elections because they just don't feel that in whatever seat they might be in, that their vote makes a difference. Now here in Oxford, obviously, they're more marginal seats. <coughs> Votes do tend to make a, a difference at, at, uh, at elections here. But in many seats around the country, the so-called safe seats, then people know that, that, you know, barring a revolution, their vote often doesn't make a difference. And so Alongside the, you know, the, the, the work that undoubtedly we need to do in, in, in honing the messages is, is absolutely about challenging this voting system. And I think, you know, I think in some senses the, the Brexit vote itself can be seen as a, as a kind of an, uh, what happens when you, when you suddenly do give people the right to have a meaningful vote. In other words, a vote that will count, whichever way they cast their vote clearly counted. And as a result, far more people actually went out and took part in that, in that vote. 
you know, I think you, you can see that people do want their say. And, and, and part of the anger that many people feel is because they've been denied a real say, because they haven't felt as if being asked once every four or five years to put a, a cross in a ballot box isn't making any real difference. So, yes, we need to change the, the, the voting system. We, we need to also make it really clear, I think, that, that, that the green policy package is, 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 is a package that is already very, very um, popular and, and, and part of the furniture, frankly, in most other European countries and in, in other countries too. You know, where you've got those different voting systems, green politics is, is, is just part of the political infrastructure. And, and, and here in this country, we're still struggling to, to get to that point. But it does feel that the Greens are, are, are kind of sitting on, on an extraordinarily valuable set of policies that have an internal robust logic in a way that, that frankly, most other parties don't. That once you put at the heart of all your policies a recognition that you simply cannot go on growing indefinitely in the current way that we are on a planet of finite resources, once you put that at the heart of it, then a whole set of, of consequences then pan out in education and health and the economy and so on. So I, I, I think that there's a real possibility to reach out to young people in particular with a, with a set of policies that are based on, on hope and on empowering people, to go back to the earlier question. Um, right now, of course, we're seeing lots of young people flocking to, to Jeremy Corbyn, but I, I, I don't think that's a permanent thing. I think we're in a kind of state of what's been called swarm politics now. You know, do you remember not so many years ago, people kind of swarmed to the SNP? Uh, and then we had the Green Surge in 2015 when our party was the only party that was there countering and challenging austerity. Now it's gone to Corbyn, but I don't, I don't sense that's the end of it. It feels like a whole generation now of younger people have recognised that the party political route is a, is a perfectly legitimate, valid and helpful, useful way of, of expressing their concerns. Until recently, you know, if you were political with a small p, you perhaps follow that up through the non-government organisations or, or, or through working with, with, with others locally. But now I think people are recognising that that party political route has a vital role to play too. And that's enormously exciting because it means there's even more to play for when it comes to, to, to getting people to vote green. We know that young people in particular are far more likely to vote green. Whenever you have school elections, over and again, the Greens come top. Um, which isn't the only reason we want to extend voting to 16-year-olds, but it would, it would, be, it would be helpful. Um, so, so I think there's, there are good reasons to be, to be hopeful. And, and, you know, maybe there'll be questions later on about, about you know, the, the, the Labour Party under Corbyn. But the Labour Party under Corbyn is no doubt better than the Labour Party under previous leaders. But, you know, he doesn't get the environment. He is not standing up to challenge this hideous Tory Brexit. And if you want a party that is out there that is genuinely combining social and environmental justice and been talking about things like bringing rail back into public ownership for years, decades, then, then yeah, the Green Party is it. In principle, I, I, I certainly agree with that. And I think anyone who's kind of saw what the Green Party did um, in the election of 2017, when we were pushing the idea of having a, a progressive alliance, working with other parties, particularly around the issue of electoral reform at that point, but standing aside in some seats, as happened here in Oxford. You know, the Green Party, I will take lectures from nobody about the fact that we have really put our, you know, our, our, our cards on the table there and really made some quite serious sacrifices, for want of a better word. That's the word that came to my mind, so I'll say it. Um, when it comes to, to doing that on the environment, I mean, to some extent, we already do. I mean, you can imagine as a single MP in Parliament, I don't get much done if I work solely on my own. Um, and so, yes, I'm, I'm often working with others cross-party to try to get things done. But the importance of having a strong Green Party there that doesn't submerge its identity in a, in a kind of a, in, in a, in a, in a wider mass, if you like, I think is so important because for none of the other parties is it yet quite the, the, the urgent priority that it is for the Greens. And what tends to happen time and time again is that you have other parties that will have, you know, sometimes very strong environment policies written down. But as soon as they come into contact with another set of policies, most usually economic policies, then you'll find such a contradiction. And so, for example, just now in this environment plan of Theresa May, she's going to spend £5.9 million planting X number million of, of trees without noticing that the route of HS2 is going to destroy around 35 ancient woodlands. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And those kinds of contradictions come up again and again and again. And unless you've got a party that will say, hang on a minute, the, the economic system itself needs to change 
so that we then can build a more sustainable future and a more hopeful, positive, better future, but nonetheless one that is sustainable. Unless you've got a party willing to say that, then when push comes to shove, then it tends to be the, the short-term economic gains that will win out. Well, that is the question that um, has been keeping many of us awake for a, for, for a long time. And, and I would simply stress, I suppose, two things. One is that, and as you acknowledged yourself, the Labour Party is not a monolith. And, and there are more and more voices in the Labour Party that I think are challenging the idea that they have you know, the, the, the kind of the, the, the full rights to, 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 um, to, to rule in the future. In other words, that increasingly, um, I think that there are people in the Labour Party, particularly people who are active in organisations like Compass and, and, and so forth, who recognise that actually no one single party has a monopoly on wisdom. I co-edited a book with Lisa Nandy, you know, the Labour MP for Wigan. And it was a, a fascinating experience, really, when, when her background was kind of, was, she would say, the working men's clubs of Wigan, and my <laughs> background was in, you know, the, the, the kind of interesting areas of Brighton. It was a very interesting <laughs> combination. But we, we thrashed out that book together and came to a much deeper understanding of each other's politics and crucially respected the fact that we were bringing different things to, of, of value to the table, that each of us came from a tradition and that politics was the richer for having that diversity. Now, I take your point that right now that hasn't necessarily convinced Jeremy Corbyn, but it is convincing people around him. I mean, it's interesting, for example, that John McDonald now supports electoral reform, and he's repeated that several times. I think to answer your question, what can people do? There are fantastic organizations like Make Votes Matter, who are going around the country working with local Labour Party groups to try to get them to put forward motions that are passed at their local parties uh, around the country and then that get uh, you know, taken up at the, at the Labour Party conference to push for electoral reform. Not only because it means that were an outcome at the next election to be in Labour's favour, that, that would be a more sustainable um, outcome, in other words, not one that could just be overturned again in four years, but one that really means that you're there for the, for the longer haul, but also because of a recognition that, as I say, no one single party has that monopoly on wisdom. Politics is a richer when we come together. And, you know, that can perhaps sound very idealistic, but I was really struck. I mean, it was interesting. The Progressive Alliance idea was a challenge because it was meant to be a four-year strategy and it had to be concertinaed at very short notice into the two or three months we had before the last election. But going around the country and talking to, to different groups, I was struck by how much that really did resonate with a lot of people, including a lot of Labour Party members. Um, and so I suppose my, my answer to you has to be that I, I think that there are more cracks and fissures and differences within the Labour Party than it sometimes appears when you're looking from the outside. I think momentum has brought a whole load of people into the, into the Labour Party who are much, much less tribal. Of course, some of them are tribal, a core of them are. But there's also a lot of young people who are not tribal, who are actually attracted by, by the idea of a fresh-looking politics, and I think would be you know, much more um, amenable to the idea of having some kind of, of, of cross-party working. So, you know, call me a, 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 a naive optimist, but I, 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 uh, I, I think there are causes for optimism. Thanks for the question. On the first one, it's quite interesting that the Green Alliance, which is a, an organisation you probably know, which brings together, um, a, it's kind of like an umbrella organisation of many of the, um, of the bigger environment groups, and they do do a kind of a, a training for new MPs if they wish to take it up, which is kind of like a, a, a crash course in, in, in environmental literacy, essentially, but particularly around climate change, but, but, but more broadly too. Now, of course, you could argue that the ones who kind of go for that course and will sit and listen to it are probably the ones who are already minded in that direction. But nonetheless, I think it is important that we, we have that uh, grounding, not least because on the most recent surveys anyway, there are extraordinarily few scientists in the House of Commons. I mean, I'm, I'm not one either, I hasten to add, but we need more of that, of that understanding, that literacy, and, and never more so really when it comes than when it comes to some of the issues around climate change, understanding the difference between risk and uncertainty, for example. I mean, these things really matter. Um, and to have so many politicians, even ministers, who, who, who don't really get it, I think is quite scary. So we certainly need to have that literacy in our schools, making sure that we keep the space for that in all of the pressures on the national curriculum and, and, and so on. Um, and, and certainly on up through, 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 through the education system and, and beyond in, into parliament as well through initiatives like the Green Alliance one. In terms of um, 
what advice to, 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 to young people wanting to get into the green world? Well, I mean, the great thing in one level is that there are just so many different avenues now. And it's in a sense, you're kind of spoiled for choice because there are so many um, degrees or so many colleges and so many um, organizations that now have got sustainability at their heart. And so I guess my advice is not going to be terribly helpful, but I, I, I think in a sense, you know, just identify what you love and go in there and do it. Because it feels to me that whether that means being in a, in a big corporation, for example, but being their sustainability person who's beginning to move those big titanics in the right direction takes a hell of a lot of work and a lot of grit. And those people who are kind of in the belly of the beast, if you like, are, are hugely important, just as important as the people on the outside who are trying to bring, bring pressure on the, on the outside just as the people in local councils or in parliaments, you know, it feels to me that when you try to work out how change happens, to be honest, I guess we, don't, we often don't know what, what it was that actually provided the tipping point to make change happen. But what we do know, I think, is that the more you've got people working in, in coordination to the best way possible in all of those different places, then that gives us the best chance of shifting things in the, in the right direction. So that's what I would say about that. And of course, I would encourage you to join the Green Party because what would you expect me to say? But here in Oxford, the Green Party is very strong and has had a great uh, tradition and track record here. And, and we would be delighted to uh, see you there. I mean, it, it, it sort of begs the question about what kind of changes would need to happen to push the businesses in that direction, the corporations in that direction. Um, and part of that has got to be around the, the, the policy environment right now, where right now most of them are lobbying on the wrong side. So that's part of the reality as well. I guess there's a strategic choice there, isn't there, about, about whether or not you think that that kind of, of, of intervention is the most effective way to, to bring about the change that we need fast enough. I mean, does the risk of what you're describing, of course, is that is that it, it sanitizes the fossil fuel industry and, and perhaps if they were able to give the impression that that's what they were going to do, even though the technology isn't always there to make it happen, maybe that means that there, there'll be more and more incentive to keep our investments in fossil fuels rather than shifting it. I mean, there are, there are opportunity costs of doing what you describe. And, and when at the same time, you've got a government, for example, that has just said it's not gonna give any more support to renewable energies until 2025, tucked away in the budget, small print, uh, when you've got a government that has torn up quite a lot of energy efficiency requirements, so it's made a complete mess of the Green Deal policy, you, you know, you've, you, you've, you've got choices to make and how much you trust those fossil fuel industries, how much you trust the regulators to make sure they do what they say they're going to do, how much you trust the technology to be there to make it possible for them to do what they say they're going to do. And, and I don't think it's unreasonable to have some concerns about all of that. And when you're trying to work out where best to put your energies, as, as organizations with limited resources as, as, as all of them are, I don't know that I would blame them for, for example, pushing far harder to get divestment from the fossil fuels industry as well. So, yeah, I don't know that I'm, I'm disagreeing with you, but I'm just saying that I think those other strategies are equally as legitimate and that there are risks in all of them. I think if you have got within you the, 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 the commitment and the vision and the, and the desire to be involved in party politics, then do it. Do it. We need all of those things. We need colleagues who don't wear their party preferences on their foreheads to go and talk to others that will then, you know, I take her point that if you're trying to persuade uh, someone who is overtly right wing, if you like, if you're going there with a Green Party badge on your, on your, on your lapel, you're potentially less likely to persuade them than if you're going with, with, with you know, j just with a commitment to, to the issues at stake or from an organization that is non-party political. I, I, I take that point. But I also think we vitally need those people in politics so that when that person has been successful in persuading the right-wing person in question to change their views, they need a vehicle for which to, you know, which to support at the, at the ballot box. And, and having that effective threat at the ballot box concentrates people's minds wonderfully. I mean, we've seen it time and time again, that even when green people haven't been elected, the mere fact that other parties are having to answer them at hustings or seeing the pressure of green votes stacking up, it has an impact. 
I mean, the most beautiful one was quite a long time ago now, but you and I will both remember it, 1989, the Green Party in the European elections before, it was before the European elections were under a, a form of proportional representation. We got 15% of the result and we didn't get any seats, but that 15% of the result made the environment a political issue in the way that it hadn't been before. And plenty of the environment groups have been gracious enough to, act, to acknowledge that. So we can still have that effect. And because, generally speaking, in, in life, there are fewer people who join political parties than there are who get involved in other organizations. If you are one of those lovely, wonderful people who, who feel at home in a political party, then please stay there and work there because there are plenty of others who will be doing that other work out there, which is still equally, you know, equally urgent and, 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 and valuable. But if you're someone who can work in that political environment, then, then we need you to stay there because that threat at the ballot box is what helps to concentrate minds. I absolutely agree with you. Um, and just to, um, to cite some of, of, of George Monvio's sort of insights into that, you know, he kind of says that, in a sense, those of us who care about the environment have, have really, you know, messed up our own cause by, by using language that is just so off-putting off to so many people, so environment or natural capital or these kinds of technical ways in which we manage to put up a, a real barrier between ourselves and what is basically you know, beautiful green spaces, places that we love, places that we want to go back to, places that we hold in our, in our memories. And, and the more that, that, you know, and the Green Party is guilty of this as much as anyone else, but the, the more we can actually communicate in terms that mean something to, to real people, rather than making it sound as if, if our cause is some kind of scientific technical fix, then yeah, that will make us more successful, I'm sure.